Well, good morning. Good morning. How you doing? <laughs> We're healthy. You're here. Yeah. Praise God. Not everybody got to be here today. I'm bringing you greetings from Bishop Trimble. He follows us around. My ministry is an extension of his because he can't be in all the churches. Can you hear me? I, I, I can be louder. Do I need to be louder? All right. You have to help me. I think I'm, I don't know if I've preached here before, so this is pretty exciting. Um, well, I wanted to say from Bishop Trimble and all of us superintendents, happy, ooh, there we go, happy Transfiguration Day. Turn to somebody and say happy Transfiguration. Happy Transfiguration. What? What is that? Have you celebrated the Transfiguration before? No? Not that you remember. Are, are you going to have Ash Wednesday? So, so if you follow the church year, Advent, do you know what I mean when I say Advent and Christmas? An epiphany, if you follow it around, right before Lent, there's this Sunday called Transfiguration Day. We read the story that Heather wrote, wrote, read, um, <laughs> that Heather read about the Transfiguration. Happy Transfiguration Day. And, and so I want you to follow with me. We're going to look at the scripture. And Matt, if you want to go back to verse 2 and like follow along, you, you can do that or not. It's up to you. Um, at Radnor, they display pictures of things behind me. And I have no idea what was on this talking. But I wanted to unpack this a little bit because I think it's really an important story. Right before this, Jesus has told the disciples, hey, I'm going to die. And in three days, I will rise again. And they had no idea what he was talking about, but, they, but Peter was offended. You aren't going to die. That can't be right. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, because that's the direction God is going. And then he called the crowds to him, and Jesus says, okay, this is how it works. If you want to follow me, you're going to have to give up your life. If you want to save your life, you have to let it go. In fact, uh, exactly, he says, you're going to have to take up the cross and follow me, which is Lent, right? We, we retake up the cross. And, and they didn't like those words either. And I read this story many times, and I used to think um, uh, Peter, James, and John were invited by Jesus to go up and down because they were special to him. But now I wonder if it's because they didn't need a little help. He invited them in verse 2. Jesus took them up a high mountain. And if you've paid attention to scriptures throughout your life, you may remember Moses going up the mountain to deliver the Ten Commandments. And Mark wants you to remember that. So we go up a mountain, and we have mountaintop experiences. Mountains are places in scripture that people feel closer to God. In verse 3, Mark tells us, Jesus is transfigured before them. So it's transfiguration day. That word transfigured is really the Greek word metamorphosis. Do you know what metamorphosis is? Do you remember? It's like... The caterpillar goes into the chrysalis and turns into goo and then comes out a butterfly. That's metamorphosis. Or a little glob of gel becomes a tadpole and then it grows legs and becomes a frog. You know those things, right? Metamorphosis. And so it says Jesus was metamorphosis before then. He changed. And, and, and it says that his clothes shone so bright, nobody could have bleached them that bright. It had to be something besides people that made Jesus shine that way. If you read the story in Matthew and Luke, they say his face and his clothes shone so brightly. And if you've been paying attention in your Old Testament study, you remember when Moses went up on the mountain, his face shone so bright from bringing the presence of God, he had scared people, and he had to put a veil in front of him whenever he talked to people. And Mark wants you to remember that. So Jesus 
the disciples, they're up there on the mountain. Jesus transforms and becomes otherworldly, heavenly, divine. And then all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah are there too. How do they know it's Moses and Elijah? How do they know? Name tags. Name tags. No, that's not true. That's not right. You know that's not right. That's a great joke. Name tags. No, I don't know how they knew, but they knew it was Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah appear, and they have a conversation with Jesus, just like I'm having a conversation with you, just like we were standing around the coffee pot. They were just talking when Moses died. Elijah didn't die, but he was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. These people are long gone. What is this? They're there just as real as you and me talking to Jesus. And, and that's supposed to teach us something important about Jesus because Moses represents the ancient teachings and the law that God has given to the people. And Elijah re represents the tradition of the prophets that, that taught them to authorities that want to, to hurt the poor and the, and the widow and the lonely. So we're to see them talking with Jesus and know this is Jesus' company. What does that tell you about Jesus? And what does Peter do? I love Peter. Peter's me. Around December 21st, you know, the longest night and the shortest day of the year, I was out walking in my neighborhood and and behind, the sun was setting behind me at just the right angle that, the, that it shone right down the street. And I looked up, and all the trees had turned orange gold. It looked like they were metallic. Every one of the branches, I mean, it was December, there were no leaves, but every one of the branches was like drenched in that red, orange, gold color. And what do you think I did? I, I fumbled in my pocket to get my phone because I wanted it to I wanted to take a picture of it and I, I had gloves on so I had to take my gloves off and get my my phone and then then unlock it and then turn on the camera app and then by the time I got my phone up to take the picture, what do you think happened? Just like that. And I thought, oh, I missed it. Like the glory of God, the burning bush, the beautiful sunshine that I had nothing to do with, didn't ask for, was there right in front of me, and I missed it. Because I was trying to make it last. Peter sees Jesus shining, sees Moses and Elijah, sees them alive, talking to him just like that. Peter says, it's a good thing we're here. <laughs> we should build three shelters. And you all can just stay there. You can just stay here worshiping God forever. It'll all be great. Right? Right? He wants them to stay. Mark is really kind to Peter. There's a little parenthesis there that says he didn't know what to say. They were all so afraid. They were afraid. It was amazing. And this is happening. I don't know what your response would be, but that sounds like my response. And Mark is so kind, but then there's more that happens. A cloud appears. You might remember Exodus 24, where the cloud descends on the mountain where Moses and God are, and that's the glory of God. The Shekinah glory of God descends on the mountain. Well, here's this cloud. You might remember at Jesus' baptism, there was a cloud and a voice from the cloud, the cloud at his baptism, the voice said, this is my son, my beloved, in him I am well pleased. And this time the voice says, this is my son, my beloved, listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. And just like that old story, the, the, the voice comes, God speaks, and then it's over. It's just over. All we know is done. And Jesus and 
Peter and James and John go down the mountain. And what does Jesus say to them? Verse 9. What does he say to them? Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. I, I practice my messages out loud. I was reading this message out loud in my home. And I have an office and a bedroom there. And my 26-year-old daughter walked by and she said, What? Don't tell anybody after? After all that? Then he tells them not to say anything? Aren't we supposed to go out and preach the gospel? Aren't we supposed to tell people about Jesus? And he said, don't say anything. And I said, my entire books have been written about this verse. Why would he tell them not to say anything? So I pondered that a minute. They've experienced the glory of God. Have you ever experienced the glory of God? Maybe it was a sunset like me, or maybe you were on a mountaintop, or maybe you watched the boys um, dunk a football in there, and it felt really good. You've experienced the glory of God. Maybe you held your grandbaby in your arms. Have you ever held a child in your arms and just looked at that baby? Maybe you've been healed after a long illness, or maybe maybe something just went your way. You got the job you tried to get. Have you ever experienced that moment of just like, oh, I couldn't have made this happen, but this happened, and I'm so blessed to be part of it. Do you know what I'm talking about? But how do you tell someone else about that? The bishop and my superintendents, we went down to Alabama to take a civil rights pilgrimage, and we went to many of the sites. Um, we, we went to a museum that's on the site of the biggest slave auction in Alabama. We got to experience some of what that might have been like in we had that experience, and, and, and I, I was just stunned by it all. I, I studied this stuff. I knew the history. I, I, wasn't, I didn't think I was an ignorant person. But suddenly, it was hit, the suffering and the injustice, and also the powerlessness. The powerlessness of people to change the way things were. And I wanted to tell people that. I'm telling you about it, but I'm not going to give you any details. It's like, how could I explain this? You kind of had to be there, you know what I mean? And you should go. But I can't explain the heaviness and the darkness that, that descended over me when I realized I was in a safe little classroom in Star City when kids were being killed. I thought about that and how the, the myth that the schools are safe, I believe that because my school was safe, but not every school is safe. And I came home and on, and on the way home, I pondered, like, what do we do with this now that we know? Because once you've seen Jesus in the face of another person, once you've seen him blow on the mountain, once you've noticed that God does things that we can't do, you can't unknow that. You can't unknow it. Once you come back from the dead, once you think your life is over and then it's not, you can't unknow that experience. Explain to somebody else what it's like. I'm getting older. I can't explain to my 21 year old son what it's like to be an old person. He'll have to live it for himself. I can just say, I, I can't throw the football with you anymore. My shoulder won't let me do it. There are things that we know that we can only know by living, and one of them is encountering Jesus. And the command given by the voice of the cloud, listen to him, I think, is really important. Because they come down the mountain from this beautiful experience, just like I might come back from church camp or a retreat or back from a vacation in Hawaii where I experience sun and sand. I come back to my daily life. They go down the mountain, and there's, a, there's somebody there with unclean spirits waiting to be healed. There's a crowd there suffering and struggling. They're going to walk down that mountain into a life where they are now headed toward the cross, where the religious authorities are going to be against them, where the government authorities are going to be against them, where Jesus will be increasingly hated. And they will have to decide how with him they're going to be. They need this metamorphosis day. They need it. We need it. So we know who Jesus is. 
when people co-opt his name for their agenda, when people co-opt his name to, to justify killing other people, when people co-opt his name to justify hate. We need to remember who he is because he's the one walking with us. And I think we need to remember that word, listen. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being awesome and 1 being not very good, hold up your fingers. How good are you at listening? Oh, a 7. Awesome. My goodness, is that good? How good are you at listening? Turn to your, if you came with a spouse, ask your spouse, how good are you at listening? If you're a kid, ask your parents, how good are you at listening? If you're a parent, ask your kids, how good am I at listening? ways to focus us, right? To, they're not magic. It's just a word that helps you focus on 
on God and what God's trying to do with you in the year ahead. We need reminders. And this story is the reminder. As you go to be dashed, as you go into Lent, as you, just, as you remember that you'll be tempted just like Jesus was, it, it, as you remember you will suffer just like Jesus, as you remember there will be times in our lives where God doesn't swoop in and save the day, but rather we struggle and we experience pain, we will remember in the midst of that is Lord. And one of the things I can take with me from that civil rights tour is when they were struggling the most, the people who were being persecuted were singing praise to God because they believed that God could do what they could not. So I ask you, what are you trying to hold on to instead of listening? What are you trying to control instead of surrendering? What are you terrified of and avoiding? Are you willing to listen to Jesus? Are you willing to listen to Jesus? And if you, like me, need a reminder, then we put in here some things. There's feathers and stones and marbles and things for you to take home and put somewhere you need a reminder most to listen to God and not the voices of your head or the voices of other people, but really listen to Jesus and what he's saying about who you are and who you're called. So we're going to sing.